increasing liquidity, then pull it back out at a higher price, netting off not insignificant amounts, but like making a small profit. They, they did this um, in probably about a dozen different transactions in on Thursday. And then what they did is they ref, we updated the swap fee to try to make it unprofitable. And, and our calculation showed that 15% should have worked. But then what this, this person did was they turned it industrial scale and made it so that there were thousands of transactions all in sequence. And because you're on Polygon, it costs, you know, less than a penny to run all these transactions. And so they and targeted the largest pools using this same function where 15% wasn't a high enough fee to deter them. And so last night, what we did is we raised the swap fee to 100%. That broke the market, and this is what we wanted to, so they couldn't run any scripts. And then today, we reduced back down to 90% so that we could we could have the market function in some form, but still make it so that it was impossible for them to run this attack uh, at this rate, because then um, most of the proceeds from what they were doing would go back into the community wallet. So... Uh, we asked the community to remove any liquidity, and we still do. And we're going to move towards a direction where it's only going to be fixed price or free assets for now. Yeah. Um, and then also, what we're doing is we're going. We have a plan to remove the data data pool functionality. And I can go go into some of that thinking uh, a, a little further. Uh, we're going to implement this VE Ocean concept that we've been working on for quite a few months. It was part of uh, Trent was doing a lot of that, and he he was going to um, talk about this just after this. Uh, as part of that, we have to update the data farming to reward uh, consumption on all price data data sets, and this means that um, as we roll out new templates for pricing, all of them will be automatically under data farm data farming. Uh, right now, it had only been pooled data sets uh, or pool, uh, data pools that got data farming. Now it'll be everything except for the free. So this is actually a, 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 an advantage and a, and a net positive. We're looking also at the attack vector to see what um, what we could have also done to prevent this or to mitigate it earlier. Uh, we've already gotten reached out to by a few folks like Mazari, uh, Binance, and a couple of them, and they've said that they're willing to help and they've graciously reached out to us so that was really nice um and then we're going to calculate losses after this is all said and done we're going to calculate the losses uh by taking a snapshot and then and then um making sure everybody's whole yeah uh as you uh other stuff like the ocean activities like the core development all that stuff continues the ocean dow rounds are continuing shipyard data bounties is all going to go on as planned yeah so um, that's kind of the summary. What we what we saw was that the what we realized from all of this was that the the AMMs base like like using an AMM with dynamic pricing that type of um, approach introduced certain risks on both stakers um, as well as the rest of the participants, and we think that. There still is a design space where that could be possible, but right now to simplify it so that we can focus on making it safe for stakers to participate, as well as ensuring that both consumers and publishers can have kind of a fair economic deal, we're going to kind of put a Chinese wall between those two so that you can publish a data set at a fixed price. Um, you can eventually we'll have things like auction, bid, you know, other types of templates for pricing and that is an economic deal that that happens between publishers and consumers and i think and i think that that's kind of the right heuristic and then on the other side as well we have this ve ocean concept that allows for the ve ocean to act as the proxy for voting earning yield because you you've locked your ve ocean getting a portion of the market uh revenue uh as well as being active in curating data sets uh, without putting that token at risk. And so Trent can talk a little bit about that. So that's the quick overview. And uh, yeah, um, see if there's any other comments. And then if not, I can start going through some of those questions.
50 folks. It's a, it's a good turnout. Um, all right. Well, then let me just go through some of the questions. Oh, was that somebody who wanted to say something? Okay. So um, first question was, um, you know, what was the mechanism of this attack was possible? It's, a, it's actually a very simple attack. It's, it's, it's using the mechanics of an AMM to jack up the price of the data token and then trying to pull it out at the higher price. And there's a net gain on that, but it's not like rug pulling. Like you're not t taking out all the liquidity. You have to do this kind of in smaller chunks. But if you uh, uh, string it together, then you can take 100 bucks here, 200 bucks here, 500 bucks here, and just continue doing that. And then you can take out a significant amount of liquidity. Uh, you can't take out all the liquidity, but you definitely can take stuff. And so in terms of the marketplace usage, it it's completely separate. Um, the data set, the usage, the volume, the consumption volume, it has nothing to do with this attack because this attack is actually on the liquidity, whereas the consumption is completely separate. Um, so I don't I don't think that there would have been any like if there was a half million dollars of consumption, uh, the only impact would be that if the publisher didn't re inject those data tokens back into the uh, pool then the, the data token price would have increased, but that, that's kind of part of the normal mechanic. So then the second question is uh, the future and what happens with dynamic pricing. So uh, we're probably going to be removing, the, or we, we are going to remove the dynamic pricing aspect right now. As I said before, there is a design space where we think that that could be possible, but right now, I think what we've shown with V3 and with V4 is that there are certain, when stakers, stakers is the wrong word, liquidity providers put into a, uh, a data pool, it's subject to impermanent loss. Uh, there's risks that most people don't associate with staking, right? So uh, part of it might be nomenclature where we've been using the word staking, where it's actually liquidity provisioning and liquidity pr provision has inherent risks. So if we turn that off, what, how does that happen? What happens with dynamic pricing? Well, it means that that first indicator and the first indicator based on the stakers uh, of price of a data set is removed. And that means that uh, data providers are back to tinkering with multiple different types of pricing models, whether it's fixed price, subscription price, all that sort of stuff to try to find uh, the sweet spot in where consumption is happening. And I think that right now with the ocean market, it's pretty new. So people who are going to consume are going to consume it um, for a reason. Like the distribution isn't as broad uh, as if we're kind of fully, fully, uh, if there's a, thousands of people who are aware of the market and, and really active in using it. And I also think that the data bounties uh, is bringing context around the data or will bring context around the data to help kind of show how data will be consumed for what reason and under what context. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. And then finally, uh, I think those are two questions. So I'm going to pause there, give, give a chance for any comments or questions. So um, yeah, as a follow up, um, so like is the plan to iterate further on this in the future or to just leave it be for now, like, uh, so like in the next one year, two years, are you going to work on the aim part, the dynamic pricing part? Because for me, this is a very important aspect, you know, like normally all data markets have this huge issue, but maybe with a larger number of participants, um, then you would start to reintroduce this feature? Yes, possibly, possibly. As I said, there, we think that there's a design space, but you know, there, there was, um, there was uh, a couple of uh, academic papers, one called What's, What is the Price of Data? And the other one is the Survey of Data Marketplaces and Their Business Model. And it turns out that they looked at um, dynamic price data, where you could do uh, the price of data could change. And it turns out that the context of usage, the context of consumption, in other words, whoever is buying the data and what they're trying to accomplish has more of an impact on the price of the data than anything else. In other words, if I have a data set, let's say crypto data, and I'm running Mazari, and I wanna run analytics on top of that because I can, I can sell subscriptions. That data is worth something to me. 
maybe it's worth a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks. If I'm a hedge fund trader and I'm into crypto and I'm a whale and I got five million dollars and I look at that same data asset and I can then trade on that and make fifty thousand or a hundred thousand per trade, then that data set's worth a lot more to me. It's worth ten thousand dollars maybe. Meanwhile, if I'm a researcher uh, and I need that data set, it might only be worth one hundred to a thousand dollars to for me. And so it turns out that dynamic price could be a misnomer, and its strongest value is in the initial setting, just an indicator from a market, but it's just one data point. That's why, for instance, data bounties give kind of ideas on the multiple contexts in which a data set could be sold, and from that, a data provider has a better idea that um, perhaps they can have multiple different types of pricing schemes based on the context of usage. So uh, that was a long answer to tell you that dynamic pricing is definitely one of those options that's still open. Using an AMM, it's not something that we're probably going to be focused on right away. We're focused on rolling out this VE Ocean, making sure the Ocean DAO voting mechanism can use VE Ocean, making sure that the data farming uses the VE Ocean, the uh, and the, as well as the basic uh, mechanics of the VE Ocean where people can earn yield. But I'll hold back on that one and let Trent jump into that one later on. Any other questions? Okay, with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Trent. Go ahead. All right, hi everyone. Um, yeah, it's been a, a interesting uh, several days, I think, for, for many of us. So thank you, thank you to all of you who have been, um, you know, reporting issues that you uh, have seen, and um, you know the activity in the channels and stuff. We appreciate that. We appreciate your um, engagement with Ocean. Um, and with that, yeah, uh, as Bruce had talked about the um, some details around the attack and uh, the measures, uh, I'll talk a bit more about the e Ocean. Now, everything I talk about um, is a document in a new blog post that we just put out called uh, Introducing PE Ocean. And um, so I'm going to talk to that, but then I will open to questions. So um, by background, um, about a couple of years ago, Curve introduced this concept of VE tokens, in their case, VE CRV. And um, others, it's been so successful as a concept, others have adopted it, um, notably Balancer, and, um, uh, about uh, eight months, six months ago, um, with great success, and more recently, New Order. So those are a couple teams that we collaborate with a lot. Um, and the core mechanic of VE tokens is that you um, take your regular token, like Ocean, you lock it into a, a vault, a contract, and in return, some VE tokens, in our case, VE Ocean, get minted into your wallet. Um, and the, long, the longer you lock your token for, the more V Ocean you get. So um, that's the, the high, higher low mechanic. Um, and I'll just go into a few more details here. So um, you, basically, you know, you can lock for you know one week, one year, up to four years. And um, if you lock 1,000 Ocean, you get 1,000 Ocean back at the end, plus rewards along the way. And the rewards come in a, uh, a couple ways and other benefits. So um, rewards, uh, you get, um, you're going to get um, half the community fees. So the community fees, you know, whenever there's a swap that happens or a consume that happens, um, that right now is already going to the Ocean community wallet. And um, this is the number that got changed from a small percentage to 15% to, to 100% to 90% recently. Um, so half of that will go to the VE Ocean holders. This is in line with how Curve works, where in its case, um, the fees come from uh, LP from from swap fees on the Curve pools, and um, a, a lot of the those fees go to the VE Curve holders. Okay, that's the first. Um, so that fees from activity in Ocean ecosystem go to VE Ocean holders. Second, data farming. So um, we have um, reconciled data farming with VE Ocean. What does that mean? The budget that we have for data farming, which is um, quite substantial, um, hundreds of millions of Ocean tokens, 
um, spread over many years, of course, uh, with our, our timeline uh, um, that we have, have laid out before, the alpha, beta, and main. Um, now what's going to happen is the rewards um, alloc budgeted for data farming are going to stay for data farming, but data farming is going to play very closely with VE. So before, when you were LPing into an AMM, that's what made you eligible for data farming rewards. Now, to be eligible for data farming rewards, you lock Ocean, and from that, you can just be passive and you'll get some rewards from that. But if you want to be active, then you can take your VE Ocean and you can allocate them to various pools. No, sorry, not pools, to various data NFTs. The pools will be there. And these data NFTs, they can have fixed price pricing. They can have other pricing in the future. It doesn't matter. Um, it's independent of what the pricing scheme is. So you can allocate, um, you, let's say you've got 100 uh, VE Ocean tokens. You could allocate 20 to um, data NFT number one and, uh, and 80 to data NFT number two and ignore the rest. And then if um, data NFT number one has a lot of data consume volume, you're going to do well, um, and number two as well. But let's say that some other data asset had all the consumed volume, and those two that you allocated to had none, then you're not going to earn as much. Um, you'll miss out. So, um, but there, with data farming, we're going, we're having a passive part and an active part. So by default, it's all passive, and you'll just get a cut. But the active part is if you choose to allocate, then half of your uh, half of the data farming rewards budget will go to the active allocation. And that way, um, people can always get a baseline yield if they want to be just a passive staker. There's been a lot of ask for that from the community. But there are those in the community as well who want to actively stake. Um, and in this case, what that means is staking is locking the VE Ocean tokens. And then um, you can allocate them to various um, data NFTs. And in allocating, of course, um, because the, the VE Ocean, you can't move from your wallet. Um, that's just a feature of how it works. Um, so allocating would be simply linking um, on chain, having a link on chain of um, this. Um, these VE are pointed towards this uh, data NFT. So um, yeah, that's a bit of the high level of VE Ocean. One final thing, um, or a few more things, I guess. Uh, the V. So VE is short for vote escrowed. The escrowed is the locking. Uh, uh, the vote is for voting. So we're going to make it where when you vote in Ocean DAO, it's um, going to be with VE Ocean. So uh, overall, um, this is overall quite a simple mechanic, right? You, you put your Ocean into this vault, it's locked up for you know one week, one year, four years, and then it goes unlocked. And um, the longer you lock, the more VE Ocean you have, and therefore the more rewards you can get, um, and the more voting power you have. And what that does is reconcile near-term goals towards you know higher yield, all of that, with long-term goals. So you know you'll have more rewards and more power in the ocean ecosystem if you are have locked for longer, if you're long-term long on ocean, basically. So that's basically the design of VE Ocean. Um, the timing is we have uh, the Nile team. It's one you know within Ocean Court. Um, we have a few different um, sub teams, and so the sub team that has been building Ocean DAO and uh, data farming, the Nile team, they are working earnestly now on VE Ocean. So, um, and what, how we're doing, connecting the existing data farming code for VE. Um, there's actually three parts. There's the smart contract part. For that, we're directly leveraging the VE curve contracts. That's a common tactic here. There, therefore, um, you know greatly de-risk security um, concerns. Um, we're going to leverage the rest of uh, the data farming backend, Python scripts, et cetera. And then the data farming front end uh, will be getting e evolved towards supporting the VE more generally. And you'll see in the blog post that it talks to this and it'll be pretty straightforward to you. Um, yeah, so that's a summary of uh, VE. Um, there's you know a, a few cool things that this, what this means is it's, in, it's completely independent of pricing for the VE and the data farming. So data farming isn't just for pools now, it's, um, or like, like it was currently. Um, once data farming restarts, when we ship VE Ocean, then it will be for the fixed rate exchange. But if you know other um, third-party marketplaces have consumed in various ways, um, then that will feed into um, data farming to consume with pricing of you know your own AMMs or Dutch auctions or whatever you want. 
that all um, feeds into data farming. Um, okay, good. And let's see here. Do, 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 do. Um, uh, yeah, that is, I'll, I'll stop there and see if there's any more questions. Oh, one final thing about data farming. So um, we are just wrapping up um, data farming round four right now. So um, counting stopped as a, a this morning, July 12th. And we will dispense rewards according to the usual schedule this Thursday, July 14th. It will count the first, um, uh, all the days except for um, today, tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday. So five of seven days it will count for. So the stake that people have today and tomorrow won't count at all towards data format. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Trent. May I ask you a question? Of course. Uh, first, kudos to the Ocean team that such a short time, so many decisions to come with the solution. And on we Ocean, I want to ask if this mechanism is sort of a permission the way of bringing those tokens, meaning to not give any advantage to the attacker to use those tokens since the original token is staked. And second is that are we going to keep the same pools as it is right now? For example, for our case, the, the price dropped more than 99%. So are we going to use the same pools or do you suggest to somehow delist it and bring it uh, to the new mechanism with VOcean? So those are great um, questions, Samir, thank you. Uh, um, so to be clear, the, the pools are getting wound down, right? We can't wind down on chain, of course, but um, uh, in the front end, um, you know, disable the ability to add new pools to a given data asset and disable the ability to add liquidity to a data asset. Liquidity can still be removed. Unlike V3, order of removal doesn't matter. Um, V3 it did. That's why we had the, the locking game and all that. But V4, it's not like that. So anyone can remove, and we recommend that simply because, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Maybe there's more issues in the um, uh, then, uh, of your, que your second question, um, about, um, migration, uh, or like not migration, like if there's a, a data asset that's already published that has a pool. Um, so the team has looked into a few options. One was to have a widget where, you know, any, um, a publisher that has published a pool as well for them to be able to, um, you know, press a button and have it automatically convert from a, a pool, like basically, you know, not have the pool, just also publish um, a fixed price um, for that. And so they, they um, that was one option. Another option is simply take the asset and republish it. And um, then the an, an original asset would get put into purgatory. Um, and the way the purgatory works, of course, is um, people can still remove their liquidity. So um, with that, uh, which which is the best option? They're both, um, you know, possibilities. Um, I believe, Bruce, maybe you can correct me. I believe the the team did an analysis and is leaning towards the second option, which is um, simply republish. Bruce, do you, or anyone, do you have more information? Yeah, I th I, I think that's it because um, there there could be some technical aspects of having kind of two two different pricing schemes on the same data set, so the pool versus the fixed price. And such like that. The simplest way is just to republish uh, a second data set. Actually, when you guys do that, please let us know, and we will add the first one into purgatory. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, this would make more sense, at least for our case, because we chose the price to be able to explore the price discovery mechanism with the price of 20 cents for our data set, which if it's a, for a fixed price, then we would be more, a little bit different price we would put there. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, with fixed price, you can change the price over time. So you put out, you know, 20 cents one week maybe, but then you see uh, maybe it's crazy high demand. So you um, raise it to 30 cents, you notice that it's still the crazy high demand. So, you know, you maybe keep raising the price until you see a, a drop off in demand, right? However you want, right? And you know, um, how does a super like if you go to a supermarket, the toothpaste tube has a particular price and it doesn't change for at least a week, maybe a month or more, right? Um, and that is based on their own, you know, internal decision making about what fixed price to be. So, uh, fixed price is more dynamic than we kind of, you know, uh, than maybe we've given it credit for. Um, so it can be useful, and people with fixed price then can keep updating their prices over time. 
I see, I see. Thanks a lot. Then we are kind of doing manually the AM job. <laughs> yeah. That's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I have a question uh, regarding the data farming. Go ahead, Manan. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned there are two uh, two streams, right? Like a passive and active one. Uh, how is so? So how is the data farming rewards divided between the passive and active, or does the passive part get anything from the data farming? Yeah. So uh, great question. Um, so the the budget from data farming is directed directly to uh, VE Ocean. Um, fifty percent of that budget will just go fully passively. The other fifty percent uh, will be uh, default passive. But if you choose to be active, then um, you can allocate your your VE Ocean tokens to various data entities, in which case, you know, maybe you earn more, maybe you earn less. It depends how good you are at allocating. And um, interestingly, you know, the, the code, the backend code for data farming can stay almost the same, right? Um, we have a, a subgraph query that looks at, right now it looks at the amount of um, Ocean liquidity and H2 liquidity in various uh, data token pools, and it records that at stake, right? Now what's going to happen is instead of looking at that liquidity on data token pools, we'll simply look at the number of VE Ocean allocated to a given data NFT. Right? So the rest can stay the same. And so everything around data farming, the ops, et cetera, is going to be almost identical compared to before, except now instead of staking on pools where you've got incremental loss and the other risks, um, it is staking via locking VE Ocean and then pointing those VE Ocean towards particular I should also mention, um, this is the current design, right? But it's subject to feedback from you guys, right? So if, if you see some you know, major issues or um, ways to improve the design further, great. Uh, happy to take your input, right? So. Uh, also one follow up. So uh, VE Ocean is a non-transferable token, right? Correct. So once it's allocated to a, a wallet address that cannot be transferred to a smart contract or anything else. That's correct. Okay, thanks. There is still, and there is opportunity for convex-like setups on top, right? Um, we explicitly chose not to, you know, put some of that directly into the token, you know, with like liquid vaults, all that. Um, instead, we're just using the VE curve setup out of the box. And we hope and anticipate that um, there will be teams that build um, convex-like functionality on top. You know, maybe, uh, Manan, you have ideas? <laughs> not yet, maybe later. <laughs> if you allow trend hi everyone i would like to voice a short question i've got several times from the community maybe some who are not here maybe some who are here would that be okay or is it weird because i'm a core team member go for it okay um would you say or do you think that the, um, like locking Ocean for VE Ocean and to sort of stake through that will be safer than providing liquidity to uh, data sets or to pools? Yes. Um, if we had a, this design or been aware of this design two years ago, two and a half years ago, we would have used it then. Um, you know, VE curve had just come out, right? So here's why it's safer. Uh, when you add liquidity to an AMM, um, it's going to be always subject to impermanent loss, which means, um, you know, you put in, um, say, hey, let's ignore Ocean for a sec. Let's say you go to, um, say, Balancer V1 or V2. I'll say V1 for fun or Uniswap V2. Uh, you put in, say, some um, uh, Chainlink tokens and ETH tokens into the Chainlink ETH pool, okay? Um, and you, maybe you put $100 worth of tokens into the pool. Then let's say that um, ETH price goes up 50% and Chainlink stays flat, right? then that means that the ratio of tokens um, in the pool is a bit off and actually um, uh, arbitragers, arbors, will go in and um, add tokens such that um, the ratio uh, matches the, the price elsewhere, right? So, um, but you uh, have, have provided in that initial liquidity in a particular way, right? In, in the balance initially, right? Um, so now the, the, the ratio between the two, to two tokens is different and these arbors come in and um, they, they change, change that, but you're getting incremental loss, which basically means as soon as, if the price stays different like that, as soon as you pull out, it's permanent loss, 
right? If the price goes back, if the balance goes back exactly to what you did when, when you came in, then, um, then you don't lose, right? Um, and the idea of uh, liquidity mining programs, uh, whether it's uh, the balancer one or the data farming one, et cetera, um, is to help ensure that, you know, if there's, say, 10%, 20% impermanent loss, well, liquidity mining, if it, uh, 50% APY or whatever more, then that helps to de-risk the overall problems of impermanent loss, right? So that's the big challenge. Anytime you're um, adding liquidity into a pool, whether it's Uniswap or Balancer or Ocean Pools or otherwise, um, it's impermanent loss. Um, you know, you put tokens in and you might get fewer tokens out. Um, it's very different in VE setups because those are simply vaults that you put your token in and it just sits there locked, right? Um, and then um, th and there is benefit to the Ocean community um, for locking because you are signaling a commitment that you're going to hold on to your tokens for you know one year, four years, whatever, right? Um, and from that commitment, it's like okay, well, we want to reward the people who have committed for longer, right? Commit for four years, then you have more influence in voting Ocean DAO, but you also can get more rewards. And the more rewards part is really cool because then it aligns you know near-term goals of making more money um, with long-term goals of. Um, just like long-term thinking and growth, sustainability, uh, growth of ocean, et cetera, right? So to summarize, um, VE Ocean is much safer than Ocean Pools because Ocean Pools have impermanent loss. VE Ocean um, doesn't. Um, you, you put in a 1,000 ocean, four years later, that, that 1,000 ocean gets unlocked, you have it again. Plus, you get all the rewards in between. Perfect. Thank you very much. And may I ask if there is any percentage decided for uh, this staking periods? Uh, so, uh, as a rough cut, we're going to be using the CRV parameters. So, um, in that, you know, the maximum time frame is four years, um, and minimum is you know, on the order of a week, maybe even shorter, but uh, I think a week because they go by one week epochs. So um, that's uh, the key parameter. Um, and then in terms of the um, rewards you can get, it's going to be using the budget of data farming, right? Because it's lever it's reconciling with data farming. So um, we, you, some of you might have seen, we were exploring other ideas for data farming too, leveraging bonding curves and, and simple vaults and tokenized vaults. But, um, you know, the vault called VE is, is very nice. So in the end, we use that because, and because then we could reconcile VE with, um, with data farming. And we've been exploring, uh, you know, uh, VE Ocean um, since uh, late last year um, with uh, various friends um, inside the parameters of my work group and more, right? And this is the final result. So. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned yet, but um, the timeline for VE Ocean is three months max, maybe sooner. Um, data farming, uh, I mentioned it will pause now and it will resume when uh, VE Ocean goes live. Um, and in the meantime, um, of course, we have several other initiatives on the go, right? Um, data bounties, um, we've been making, putting out some announcements around that and there's more to come where um, you can you know, earn from that. Um, and there's also going to be work on um, improving uh, computed data in ocean market um, and any other um, things as well uh, within the ocean ecosystem. But we, after we released V4, we kept our roadmap a bit open on purpose because we knew that from V3, there was a lot of it, um, like things that we just had to do tactically, you know, fires to fight, et cetera, for months. And so... Um, we, we planned for that, we made sure that we had space, and that's what's happening right now, right? Um, the, we have uh, the, the team that had been working on the Ocean Core backend and uh, Ocean Market frontend, um, and they will continue to refine, refine that. And then the team that was really spending its time on data farming 
is going to um, and had planned to spend time on VE Ocean. Now that VE Ocean stuff is just pulled forward. Maximum three months, but you know maybe we'll get it sooner. Um, are there other questions that you guys might have? Uh, really great question so far, by the way. Uh, so, sir, in the meanwhile of this three month, then uh, we can perhaps use V3, right? I do not recommend that. Use V4 with fixed pricing. Like, it's all still there. Everything oh. is still there except oh. for the pools, right? And right. you get all the other benefits. We are not starting V3 going forward. So use V4 just with the fixed price. Okay. Or if you want, you know, fork V4 and... Um, you know, put up your own pricing scheme, you know, use a Dutch auction or whatever else you want. I'd love to see um, um, explorations like that, right? Uh, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we published a couple of blog posts on various pricing ideas and options. Um, there's a lot of ideas out there, right? And no one knows for sure what the best ideas are. Um, fixed price is a good baseline default and free, of course, too. And then beyond that, um, you know, AMMs were a good hypothesis. We still think, like Bruce said, we still think that there's great potential there. But the configurations that we've had so far haven't flown, right? Um, so, uh, so be it, right? We learn, we adapt, um, and uh, we go forward. So um, that's that's what's happening. Yeah, thanks a lot. I totally agree. This is the cutting edge of the monetization of data that is happening on ocean. And being a pioneer, this stuff happens, and uh, we are happy that we are a part of it. Okay. To be honest, I think it's really interesting. This is the first um, more sophisticated attack that ocean technology has encountered, right? Um, you know, we had the slip of it uh, a couple days ago um, where it was someone using Ocean Market directly, but then the version in the last 24 hours, it was a script. So, um, you know, it got automated and we're pretty impressed, right? They were using 600,000 Matic at a time. That's 300,000 Ocean, sorry, like $300,000 US dollars at a time, right? So. And that was kind of how they overcame the edge case, right, of like the 15%. They just had to have, they had to have really big numbers. And then even with those really big numbers, it would eke out just a small, small, small profit. But I uh, repeat that a thousand times, you, you can make money, right? So that has been addressed uh, in the sense of that was at the 15%. Now it's at a much higher fee. Um, that said, you know, I mentioned before, it's worth repeating. Um, where there's smoke, there's fire. So there might be other issues in the, in the pools. And we see that given the issues so far, um, it's, it's not really the best use of um, Ocean Core team effort to, to really try to make the pools perfect. Instead, you know, focus on other places like the community has said, like they're safer staking, you know, staking where, you, you know, your amount of ocean goes in, same ocean goes out, plus rewards, right? So we've taken that to heart with the V Ocean. And this is also why, though, going back to the pools issue, um, you know, uh, when we first, uh, for over the weekend, we raised the fee to 15%, uh, we were fairly confident that that would hold. We weren't confident 100%, but fairly confident. And um, clearly, you know, this uh, attacker found a way to, you know, optimize to get eco a bit more. Um, maybe there's more issues in the pools, right? So this is why we do recommend to remove your liquidity um, and uh, basically to not expose yourself to that. And instead, you know, um, uh, uh, there's lots of other ways to engage um, in, in the ocean ecosystem, publishing data sets, getting, you know, really driving consumed volume. And, um, and of course, when data farming goes live in three months, data sets that are going to be doing the best are the ones with consumed volume against fixed price data, right? So this is a really great opportunity to drive data consumed volume on fixed price data. Okay, cool. Um, as part of uh, tomorrow's town hall, uh, we can also devote some of the time there to answer questions. I know that a lot of the stuff is generally pretty new to everybody just because we released the blog post today, two of them. So if there are more questions, uh, tomorrow we can devote some of that time at the town hall. Um, so one last uh, round, any other questions? And if not, then we can kind of say, all right, good. We've dumped the, the information. We've educated you guys and showed you kind of where we think uh, is a good place to go towards. Yeah. So any final questions?
Yeah, I, I, have, I have one more question. So uh, there's this tool called Token Spice. I think Trent, you know that. Um, uh, so maybe it could be simulated in this tool too, uh, how all of this came to happen. And maybe if there would be a different kind of or corrected concept for dynamic pricing, it could be then tested in this tool to find out whether the, how it would behave in, in reality. Or do you do yeah. this? Um, absolutely. So uh, I have, yeah. So by background, some of the, those of you who might not know, before I was um, working in blockchain, I was working um, developing CAD tools for verifying analog and mixed signal circuits. And um, they were s simulator in the loop, spice in the loop. And um, so there is the spice simulator that basically simulates a circuit, right? The dynamics of that. And then we would build tools on top of that um, to basically um, say, okay, here's the different parameters. Um, here's uh, different, you know, power supply voltages and temperatures, etc. And then the tool would go and find the conditions that would cause breakage the worst. And we, we could do that in a worst case fashion, but we could also do that in statistical fashions, etc. And so that was, um, you know, that that was it's spice in the loop verification tools. And um, you know, we built that, and um, that. It, you know, became the state of the art in semiconductor circuit design. Um, I built Token Spice, an agent-based um, simulator that has EVM in the loop, um, as the equivalent spi for Spice, that lowest level simulator. And we actually used Token Spice with the EVM to verify the basic dynamics of, of Ocean, thanks to work with Trang and stuff too, collaborated from the token engineering community. So we, we actually managed to demonstrate um, how V3 had rug pulls using Token Spice, and then how the V4 dynamics solve those. But um, we never, uh, you know, we, we have token spice, but we don't have the tools on top yet that do this worst case verification. Um, and, you know, watching this stuff in the last few days, it's like, ah, oh, I wish, now I really want to build this stuff on top too, because it would have probably really helped here, right? So um, it, it points to definitely there's opportunity in um, the token engineering community to build higher level tools to find things exactly like this, right? So. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I definitely like I see how it can be done. I built tools like this for other industries. Um, and uh, but these things take time to build. So, you know, the focus had been just getting on V4 and the basic nominal verification um, and trying some edge cases, but we didn't try the edge cases in an automated fashion. So. So, yeah, that's definitely a thing for the future. And overall, though, um, you know, uh, I, I, I to sort of wrap up things in a bit of a high note, um, if you think about like what, what's happened over the last uh, few days, we've been planning the ocean for a while, um, knowing the benefits of it. Um, and then uh, these uh, attacks happened. And, um, uh, you know, we basically, for the first time in ocean technology, we had, you know, sophisticated attackers com coming at, at ocean. And, um, well, in every challenge, there is opportunity. And we see simply that the opportunity here is an opportunity to, to pull forward VE, which also addresses a bunch of other community questions, most specifically around safer staking. Put in a thousand ocean, make sure that no matter what, you get at least a thousand ocean out, but ideally a lot more. So, um, so these attacks basically helped spur us towards shipping this stuff sooner rather than later. So yeah, uh, pretty excited about VE Ocean and the future of ocean in general. Okay, with that, um, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, showing up. We had about 48 uh, max attendees. And um, yeah, really appreciate you guys uh, being part of the community. And uh, have a great evening. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all.